Quickly, go! The Royal Marine Commandos. Britain's premier fighting force on land and at sea. So we're going to get on board that dive and we'll do our business. Ready to deploy at a moment's notice. Returning and burning, boys. Anywhere on Earth. As strike troops, peacekeepers, seaborne raiders. Get to the front now! Operating in the toughest, <sighs> most challenging places. Only a select few were good enough. Up here. Promoted to acting corporal. To wear the green beret. Sure. Wow. And you may kiss each other. This is the inside story of the commandos. Final brief, lads. There's been no change to what I previously briefed, so this dive is still heading south at right about seven knots. No fishing gear seen, no crew seen on deck at the moment. Um, obviously, as we go in, we'll get that sort of updated picture from Gundog. Very similar to the dives we boarded before. At sea in the Gulf, Troop Commander Joe and his team of six Marine Commandos are conducting a raid on a vessel suspected of helping to traffic illegal narcotics to the UK. It's really important for the UK populace to feel protected and safe. That's why they employ us. We volunteer to come out here and do this. Um, you know, you, you should be able to, you know, you should be able to live uh, sort of free and free and safe. That's what we're there to provide. That's what I'm paid to do. These kinds of operations are really important because they essentially prevent drugs, particularly from methamphetamines, heroin, reaching the streets and, and causing harm. Nobody else can do the sort of job we do. This is a new sort of normal desk job. We'll make our weapons ready, final checks, and the ladders are ready, the med bags are prepped. I've done my final radio checks, and quite literally, there's now bullets in the chamber. And then we're released into the water, ready to close with the target. And my lads are checking now, where can, I, where can I get those ladders or what can I do, what's the threat? I have no hesitancy to order my lads into a dangerous situation, because I'll be right there with them. The lads are, are armed, equipped, trained. This is what they do. They're going down, he's going downstairs. Sit down, move forward! They're not looking to hurt people, they're looking to do their job. Each time they leave HMS Montrose, they have no idea what awaits them. In 2021, 67 tonnes of illegal narcotics, which could be worth over £144 million, were intercepted by patrols here. Pushing past now, mate. You're going to get a bus today, do you reckon? I'm well, near as well, so mate, it's your call. On this one. But this time, there's no sign of any illegal contraband on board. I think that was our 13th day that we boarded, so probably a bit unlucky, but um, we, we couldn't find anything. And now we'll go through the procedure back on board and, and get ready to go again tomorrow. At times, it's challenging physically. Early starts, late finishes. You've got to make high pressure decisions. I'm on a dow in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It's me, like, it's me and my team. The book stops there. You worry about the threats, of course, but I don't worry the lads' ability to deal with it, not one bit. With just a handful of Marines selected for each deployment, Competition for a place on board HMS Montrose is fierce. 
and the route to earning one starts back in the UK. The tasks that we're expecting our Marines to do are a lot more different and diverse than they used to be. But as for the individual, the commando training stays the same, the commando values stays the same. Stand by, three, two, one, go! If they get selected, Royal Marine Commandos will deploy on Royal Navy ship HMS Montrose. We're the Maritime Special Operations Commando, and we have a wide variety of different roles that we can do. So we have Royal Marines boarding teams, which is what we were doing on HMS Montrose. Go! There is the Joint Personnel Recovery, JPR. They're out in Norway. We stand ready for all sorts of tasking. The fuel tanker crisis, the coronavirus response, we'll, we'll do anything that's asked of us. It's vital important work. I think it was when I was 10, I saw an advert on the TV. It's your greatest weapon. There's a boot neck walking through it's like a jungle setting, and he goes through the river. He can overcome hunger. And I remember looking at it going, like, what the hell is that? That looks, that looks amazing. Royal Marines Commando, it's a state of mind. You may already have it. I was at the point in my life where I could make a decision to what I wanted to do, and this just, just fit perfectly, I think. Before I joined the Corps, I was I worked in a call centre. Uh, back in Manchester. It was very monotonous and just not really for me, so. My dad's a Royal Marine Commander still. I think I was a few months old at his pass out, so I went to his pass out when I was a little baby. And I've sort of grown up around it. I've seen the lifestyle it offers and it just seemed like a bit of me. It's what I wanted to do in my life. To prove that they have what it takes to be part of the team on board HMS Montrose, Tommy and Liam have undergone specialist training. Designed to teach them the unique skills required to board and secure a moving vessel at sea. On the boarding course, there's a, a lot of training, more specifically to do with the maritime roles that we do, which you don't really touch on much in uh, basic training. It's definitely bettering yourself as an individual, making yourself more desirable and being able to get a decent deployment on a decent ship doing actual decent boardings and feeling like we're actually making a difference. The boarding course is a very, very specialised course. It does make sure that people are ready to do this job. You know, we've got to climb a lot of ladders. We can do high access to so the container ships and the oil tankers that you see. They could climb the side of one of those damn things. That is a tricky, tricky thing to do, and it requires a lot of physical endurance. There's a reason why very few people do it. I definitely had a fear of heights, but during training where you do all the vertical assaults as well as your abseiling and stuff like that, I feel like I got over it there. Gripped hold of the rope and then threw myself over the edge. The cave-in ladder is meant for climbs that are up to 25 metres, so it is difficult. There's not a lot of room for error. If you get snagged or if you fall off, there's quite a long way down. I find it quite satisfying if you if you do it right, I think getting up it fast is where everyone should be aiming to be. The way the ladder drill works is I go over with a pistol drawn and I'll always coil up like a loaded spring, pop over and have a look so that I'm not showing too much of my body. I'm scanning before I get on. You never know what to expect. So if I did have to take a shot, I feel like I'd be ready. Um, I trust in the training, I trust in myself as well as the reasons why I'd be doing it. It's not just myself that'd be in danger, it'd also be the rest of my team. And I wouldn't want them to get hurt on my account of not being able to do my job. I really enjoy the boarding course. You do a lot of shooting and a lot of fizz. Make some really good friends, learn a lot of stuff, learn a lot of stuff about yourself, good fun. As they near the end of their training, all that stands between Tommy and Liam and a place on board HMS Montrose is one final exercise that teaches the Marines how to use the heavy weapons system carried on board, should they need to deploy them.
at the end of the day, if everything goes wrong, the last thing you can rely on is your own weapon systems. Weapon training is crucial. It's it's the the main tool that we have in our job to keep ourselves safe. It's a pretty intimidating thing to, to be faced with a, with a weapon system and we're all pretty capable of using it if need be. The thing about all Royal Marines, really, they are able to deliver lethal effect. If you want them to, they can destroy anything you want them to. But I don't ask them to do that. And so they don't. They're incredibly intelligent people. Well, we are at the point in the end that we may have to use our weapons at some point. You hope that you don't have to, but if you have to, then you will, because it's not just myself that would be in danger. It could be the rest of the team, and I'm not going to let that happen to one of my blokes. There's something within the training pipeline of the Royal Marines, something that's evolved over the years um, that is just so right. As a Royal Marine, how as a person, you can, you can just switch that light. Matty, do you see the target? To go from one person to another. I'm not explaining that you suddenly become a, a crazy gun-touting Marine, uh, loosen off loads of rounds and such in any direction. It's very particular, it's very controlled. For Mark Tomlinson, this moment came on the 15th of November 2004, when he and a group of US Marines he was attached to were ambushed along the Euphrates River in Iraq. You're always charged in conflict. You're always you're always ready for something to happen. The battle for Fallujah was a brutal six week long phase of combat, causing widespread devastation and many casualties on both sides. We were traveling up, up a river towards a large railway bridge. We were to envelop and, and search a local farm that we felt was storing ammunition and improvised mortar devices. It was at the point of the, the railway bridge where we were turning around and we actually started getting tracers. I knew that we were in an ambush. I just walked straight to the front of the craft. At the same time, my coxswain, he understood what I was going to do, that we were going to go straight into the middle of the ambush position and do a, a full front or counter attack. So he sped the craft up, hammered into the riverbank. I launched myself forward into the elephant grass. I only did that because I knew that I had my US Marines behind me. They're like your family, and should somebody come and try and attack your family, you know, this is when it all kicks in. Um, and the passion um, that you feel for the Marines to your left and right is so strong that you suddenly become this person that you find yourself, you can do stuff um, beyond belief. We pushed into the fields for um, a good hour and a half, in actual fact, fighting the enemy in different locations, far manoeuvring across fields. And all the time, in excess of 100 insurgents were sort of were approaching our position and fighting into our positions. Uh, bearing in mind there's only 11 of us. We put up a good fight. Low on ammunition, we started to retreat back to the craft. I requested some machine guns to be brought from some of the craft and actually put up on a gun line along the riverbank. Got back behind a machine gun myself, got all my lads back onto the craft. That was probably the worst time where you've gone from fighting, from taking people's lives, to all of a sudden you need to start switching now and thinking, right, have I got everybody? Looking back, when we finished that day, when we had a brief debrief that night, um, it was just beyond belief what we'd actually achieved. The most decorated Royal Marine since World War II, Matt's courage under fire earned him the conspicuous gallantry cross, one of the country's highest military honours. I think the bravery, yeah, you might draw on bravery probably from the people that you're with. You, you, you feed that bravery from them because you know that they've got your back and you're going to be OK.
Only a few months after successfully completing the final part of their training, Tommy and Liam have news on their deployment. So we're going on to HMS Montrose on a boarding team, flying out to the Gulf of Oman. We're going to be on ship for, is it four months? Yeah, till April. Yeah. I was very, very excited when I found out I was on the team. I was just buzzing to be part of like an operational output with the Royal Marines, especially on the Royal Marines boarding team because it's basically the main operational output we have at the moment. It's 885. No, it's probably our first time. Yeah, this is our first deployment. Quite lucky to get it, to be fair. It's mine and Tommy's first year out of training, so very junior, and we've managed to get quite a good deployment, so we've done quite well to get it. Straight out of training, straight into the boarding course? Yeah. So I felt nervous a little bit because it's my first deployment and you, you never want to be a crap bloke and you don't want to mess it up. So it's all well doing it in a, a calm and steady environment, but until you get out there, you, you never know what you're going to be made of. You do all this training, it's quite an intense course. So it's nice to go out and use that training that you've developed for. Actually go out and do some work. Got my Christmas jumper. There you go. That's a bit weird, being there on Christmas Day. I mean, I don't tend to go fair too well with hot weather. Even going in the shade, so hot. At 4-2 Commando HQ, where Tommy and Liam are getting ready for 50 degree heat, young officer Sam is preparing for the next step in his commando career a gruelling cold weather survival and warfighting course that takes place deep inside the Arctic Circle. Cold weather warfare and operating in, in, in those environments are pretty unique to the core. The Royal Marines have protected NATO's strategically critical northern flank since the 1970s. Every Royal Marine in the core must undergo this survival training if they're to deploy in the cold weather environment. That next big uh, war or, or campaign, you know, it could well be in, in those environments and, and, and up, up towards the north. If anything was to happen, you know, that front to our east is, is going to be pretty important and it is cold in, in the winter months. You know, and if, if we can do anything to, to counter that, it's going to be endure and sustain ourselves and be able to fight in, in those conditions. Um, and I cannot wait to, you know, get, get back out in the field. There's like boxes which, you know, I want to tick. I want to go to the jungle. I want to go to Norway. I've never deployed to a cold weather environment before. It's going to be pretty cold, but... It's just skills that you haven't learned yet. It's nerves, but it's, it's nervous excitement. Two of those bags are just full of stuff which people would like, creature comforts. There's a kettle, extension leads, wine gums. Some extra socks. <laughs> That's all sorts, yeah. I went to New York over winter. That was, that was pretty pretty cold. Uh, but there's always a, a nice cafe to to duck into and, and rewarm. And I don't think I'll find that on up in Norway. <laughs> where where the course taking me anyway. <laughs> so the high north of Norway is a harsh, raw environment. It is constantly trying to harm you as a human being. From the moment you land to the moment you leave, it will test you. Um, it will test you mentally and it will test you physically. It will put you in uh, quite a few dark places. Yeah, it doesn't feel too cold at the moment, too fair. I feel that'll change. Stepping off the plane, and I just didn't want to fall over, first of all, because even, even the airport is just, like, permafrost is, is frozen. Uh, and, and the next thing was the tops of your ears. That's what's first to go. For the first week of the course, Sam will be pushed both physically and mentally as he's taught and tested on how to sustain himself 200 miles inside the Arctic Circle where temperatures can reach as low as minus 50 degrees. 
if you don't pass the survival week and prove that you can sustain yourself in, in that environment, then you're not allowed to progress with you know, more complex tactical training. The survival week is pass or failure. I'll be your ML for the duration of this course. Been an ML since 2013, all right, and you are my survival course-wise, I think you're my 13th course. There is absolutely no shortcut when it comes to safety, especially out here. With everything that's happening now and where the world sits, we can't limit ourselves and ignore the high north. We need to be able to operate as efficiently uh, as we do in the desert and the Gulf. Sam's training begins by learning the specialist equipment and procedures that will keep him alive once the group deploy out into the Norwegian wilderness. So the survival course is all about sustaining themselves for that week. Preparation is key because of what the environment can do to you. In the UK, you're doing about 3,500 calories. Over here, you're burning about 5,000 to 6,000. So as you can imagine, ration packs are about twice the size nearly of what you carry back home. When I told my mum that I'd got into the young officer training, I think she was very proud, yeah. I got a phone call and, yeah, it was, it was pretty emotional because the selection process does take a very long time and I'd put pretty much all or nothing into it having not applied to university or anything else. Uh, so, yeah, they were, they were pretty, pretty proud, I think. How do you got it? Two of these? Yeah, two of those, yeah, they're in pairs. Large ECW. Thank you. Uh, and watch that. Medium for both? Yes. Try them on, see how they fit. On These ones you have to wear on camp? Yeah, and also in the field you might wear them quite a bit, so you want to make sure there's a bit of dexterity in them. I think everyone in this job likes new experiences and likes to push themselves, otherwise they wouldn't be where they are. Sometimes you just got to make yourself go outside your comfort zone. OK, having an impaling injury, this is something that made them bleed, or getting shot, for example. OK, so again, having something wet on you is something that needs to be taken off. I've worked hard to, to get to where I am, you know, the, the training it isn't easy by nature. Um, no, I'm, I'm just you know, grateful that I, am, I am where I am um, and, and you know, doing, doing the job. Not only is he new to Norway himself, he needs to learn everything that's happening and also instruct and manage uh, his team as well. There's a lot of expectation put on uh, his shoulders. Uh, yeah, but we need, we need to go to stores anyway at half four for, for the skis and that anyway. It's only half four, is it? Yeah. On top of a deployment in an unknown and punishing environment, 22-year-old Sam is also responsible for a troop of Marines in his role as troop commander. I'm obviously quite young. That was quite nerve-wracking and a bit of consideration when, you know, when I was going through training, because a lot of the lads are are older than me, um, but I don't think I don't think they view that. I don't think they see that. As long as you've got their respect and you're doing the job that they need you to do, then they'll they'll follow you. It's Sam's final morning on base, and having learnt in the classroom how to survive in the frozen Norwegian wilderness, it's time to put it into practice. Well, we're going to get inspected. Just make sure we've got all the right kit. OK, so we're going to kick this inspection off then. What I want to see now is all of you in full pig suit, white face mask, goggles, hoods up. Some people are missing hoods. Some people's lips are popped. And some of you have still got dark lenses in. 50 star jumps. Okay, are we all warm enough? Yeah. yeah. Do you need rewarming again? No. no. No, didn't think so. Okay, you can see how good and how efficient this kit is if it's worn properly. Anyone got any questions? Happy? 11 minutes, away you go. When it comes to operating in this environment, there is a fine line between complacency uh, and sort of respect. 
there needs to be a, a constant sort of balance and an understanding that this environment can hurt them. I need to give them as much experience and knowledge uh, as possible, which means a lot of moving around uh, on the ground, which then gets them understanding how to move through the terrain and how the snow can affect the terrain and their, their speed of movement. The wind is coming across us here. And if you look over there, you can hardly see uh, the, uh, like the mountain line or you know, the hills over there. So it's probably going to get quite snowy uh, in 15, 20 minutes maybe. Yeah, I was a pretty outdoorsy kid. It was like a bit of a battle between me and the council as to how quickly I could put up a treehouse versus how quickly I can take them down. Yeah, I was always in the woods as a kid, yeah. Beats the office, don't it? I left school at 16. After sitting in an office for a couple of years, I realised that that's definitely not for me and I needed something a bit more challenging and, and something testing and this is exactly what the, uh, the Marines has offered me. Everything I'm doing, I'm always chasing that hard training. I realised that's the direction I sort of need to be travelling in to test myself, potentially put myself in a, in a sort of bit of a bad place, but to learn and grow from it as a person. Some people do come with a slightly skewed view of Norway, thinking that it will just be a bit of easy skiing for a few weeks. However, they're sort of brought back down to earth quite quickly. It's very physically demanding, yeah. Whether that's on snowshoes or skis, movement is just very, very slow. That's probably one thing I you know, underestimated was how physical it would be. It was, yeah, that was emotional at times, yeah. All right, that's two of the tents on the left, and then one on the right. Uh, you can see now they're sort of just setting the uh, tents up, adding brushwood, etc., and then they'll be getting in there, and they've got approximately a few hours to sustain themselves, which is the important part of this first week. As temperatures drop to below minus 10, it's still a long way off the minus 30 limit that will stop the exercise. Any problems or so? No. We'll just get them into uh, our bits or into our gloves from there. It's a little bit cold. Sure, mate. Yeah. Do you want to see some baby puree? That's what yeah. we're really after. It's some sort of fruit custard. It's like baby food on steroids. Being in a, in a cold weather environment, you know, the need for to stay positive when it is cold is, is clearly important, but we're all very, very like-minded people um, who have the same sense of humour and are going through the same thing. Uh, and it's, it's not hard to achieve a positive attitude when you're all in the same boat. Mm. Do you know what? I spoke too soon, that's not too bad. If you put a crumble in a blender, that's what you'd end up with. That's not bad at all. It's pretty, pretty nippy. It's why we're cooking outside, because we were pretty much outside anyway, inside the tents, because the doors were open. <laughs> mm. Sam and his troop are up before dawn for their second day of survival training. Their first job is to clear their position ahead of moving out of the area. We need to bed about one, and then we're up at half five. So, looking for ground sign that they've potentially left behind. Little things that 
can potentially ID us as forces. It's all fun and games, isn't it? I've not had a proper look round your position because I don't think I need to. I've got here, it's a little uh, label off your clothing. You can easily type that into Google. So you can almost ID who we are just off that. This isn't just an aggressive camping trip, all right? You're here for a purpose, to operate in this environment effectively, okay? This does not fly again. Do we get that? Let's put these Gore-Tex mitts on. Okay, once your mittens are on, press up position down. Okay, you at the back, stand up, who's laying down trying to mug me off. You've got your fucking white gloves on. Stand up. What the fuck do you think you're doing? Put your mitts on now. 50, go. I've told you about the thermal properties of that white glove. Putting them in the snow, you're an idiot. I am seething now. Sergeant Bonwick is you know, a very interesting character. He's you know, clearly very, very knowledgeable, very, very experienced, you know, and he gets his point across. You don't even walk around camp with those stupid gloves on, do you? But that's just his style of teaching. <laughs> Every course we run, especially in the cold weather environment, is done in a, a safe manner, uh, and safety is key. Uh, we are training at the end, and as much as it looks like I don't want everyone to finish, I want every face that comes on my course to get through at the end. Having already trekked miles across frozen ground on barely any sleep or food, Sam and the others are now about to be pushed even harder. I think we live quite a comfortable lifestyle. Uh, in general, everything's easy, everything's quick. Um, it's so easy to go down and get a pizza or avoid the gym or just sit and watch TV, whereas being in this lifestyle and being out in different environments, having to work constantly 24 hours a day and be constantly tested and pushed. It just changes your outlook on life and you learn to enjoy everything a, a lot more and appreciate uh, everything a lot more to a sort of different level. Welcome to Fosmerfelt training area. Purpose of your visit today, survival. What I want to happen now, you are to take your day sack out and place it in front of your Bergen. Hold. From there, you are to sanitize it of all contraband. And contraband is anything other than the following items. Bivy bag, hig suit, flask, goggles. Some of you probably questioning me there thinking, he's not mentioned food. You don't require food. All right, if there is food, I will dish it out to you. Maybe a fish, it may just be a carrot. Depends how generous I'm feeling and how good your shelters are looking. Having been stripped of all but the bare essential pieces of kit, they must now build a shelter and fire to stop them freezing to death for as long as they're kept in the wilderness. So I would recommend, okay, building yourself your shelter of choice and then preservation of firewood, etc. You'll then light your fires uh, once your shelter is complete. And that is it. Go. 
Let's get some grass wood. There's nothing on the ground. I don't know what everyone else is going to use, Jen. The brush wood at the top. Ridiculously, that is so slippy and so dangerous. Yeah, it's not, not on. Especially in this area, all around. There's cut off broken trees for a training cereal, which is what this is. Absolutely not. Yeah, it shouldn't, he should not be doing that at all. Get the fuck down right now. Me and you are going to go and have a conversation. What the fuck are you doing? Like, what, what's that on your chest? This here. What does that mean you are good at? Thinking. Exactly. Thinking and leading men. That, that is your primary role, isn't it? So, all right. So with that, if you were to fall from that, look around you, all these branches sticking up, it's going through you, isn't it? So, what do you think is then happening? Uh, it's going to cause... You're dying. You're, you're dying. Yeah. That is an absolute no-go. That understood, yeah? OK, go What's away. It? Are we allowed to use it? Yes, because you've got it. And for that reason alone. Sam. All right. Yeah, apologies. Go. Thank you. In a realistic survival situation, 100% you'd be up in that tree or you'd be cutting the tree down and bringing the brushwood to you. So there's there's other ways of doing it that are safer. I didn't want to mention where I used to work as a tree surgeon, but... Right, let's lift and ship some timber yeah. from here. Yeah. Uh, pretty much straight through there, you'll see Captain Pearson. Right. We need to find the longest piece we've got. Yeah. It's probably the last one, I reckon. How are we doing? Good. Yeah. I think that's enough. If we start lifting those logs over here now. Uh, a bit further. A bit further. We'll keep it about a foot. Well, do you want to get the uh, floor logs done first, though? Yeah. I think floor logs. Looking forward to eating that. <laughs> the potato or the onion. So looking around now, they've built pretty much from what, what I can see and what I've seen, um, some good shelters. So protecting them from these elements uh, and sort of making sure they can sustain themselves in this environment. Uh, the next port of call from there then is to generate heat. Uh, so they'll make their fire and uh, that will sort of keep them going throughout the night, heating their shelter, keeping them going. And then from then on, it's just sustaining themselves with the, the food that they've got, melting snow, etc. And uh, focusing on that sustainment just in a, a slightly harsher condition. OK, so the best flooring I've seen so far. Right, hoofing. All right, I thought I'd come and lay in here to see how good it is. All right, it's, it's pretty hoofing, all right. You've done your basic sort of insulation, haven't you? And then you've done the brushwood. All right, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I think you liked it. He said, says, says it's the best floor he's seen so far. Um, uh, said the fire pit was a bit mate. close to the bedding. You know, on a bed fire, which is fair enough. But there's, there's not a mass amount of room, but it's actually really warm in there. Um, I, was, I was colder last night. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Onion soup. Onion soup. Yeah, Unbelievable scenes. I mean, I wouldn't look too closely, but... <laughs> there, is, there is onion. It's there. water with some onions floating in it. Look at that. Majestic. From a personal point of view, this is absolutely a phenomenal experience. And they'll learn a lot about themselves. A lot of team cohesion will go on. Um, they'll have all sorts of strange and random conversations around the around the fire where they're cooking and eating um, and it just it'll bond 
everyone together uh, through this sort of harsh experience. You cold? Nah. You're cold wherever you sit. I was, I was warm over here. Uh, I, was bo I was bombers over there. When you're in that survival shelter, you, you just start having all sorts of strange conversations, yeah. Uh, where Bryce is sitting now is the best place to sit. He's got the fire and you can lean against the tree. <laughs> you find out a lot about people. The range of subjects that you, you get into is, is um, probably scary. I'm a hand model. It's Friday night. Yeah. I should be on OnlyFans. All right, I'm going to take my pants off now. <laughs> The biggest challenge out here is acceptance. Accepting that you're in this situation, you don't know how long for, and you need to stay mentally strong uh, to get through it. Oh, I've fully accepted my situation. <laughs> in fact, I'm pretty sure we volunteered for it. Sam and the troop are still away from the warmth of their base, exposed to sub-zero temperatures. They've hardly eaten or slept, and they haven't been told when the exercise will end. Now, as they're coming into the, the next day, I'm probably expected to finish potentially in a few hours, but we'll, uh, we'll keep them going a little bit longer just to test their mentality and, and where they're at. Josh, could you chuck me my gloves, mate? I think it's about minus 10. Which, in the grand scheme of things, out here isn't that cold. But when you haven't slept, you haven't got any food. Uh, it does make you appreciate the little things, yeah. Like a toothbrush. I really want to brush my teeth, but I don't have a toothbrush. <laughs> You've been in this survival situation for 18 hours. Some of you, I know, have already eaten your victuals for emergency. Do we think you should be eating your victuals? No is the answer, isn't it? You haven't got a clue how long you could be here for. I could keep you here three, four days. That one opportunity you had to keep yourselves going is gone in the first 18 hours. That is poor mental discipline, which is half of the battle out here. Everyone understand where I'm coming from? Away you go. What they wanted us to understand is that a survival situation doesn't have a, an end state. Um, you, you don't know how long you're going to be isolated for. And therefore, you've got to train as if that is the case. Did you eat your emergency victuals? No. I, I genuinely didn't. Jam. In the scorching heat of the Gulf, Tommy and Liam are adapting to life on board HMS Montrose. Life on board a ship is different to a commando unit. There's only nine or ten bootnecks on board. They get that there is a, a time for work, you know, a time for relaxing. Getting on Montrose at first was a bit of a shock. I knew it was going to be small, but I didn't realise like the coffin-style beds that we were going to stay in. Yeah, the facilities. Well, all right, the gym's good. Cue Tommy now, lifting some weights. So you're always busy, you're just constantly working, and when you're not working, you're cracking your own fears and sorting out your own kit, so you need to have a lot of energy and sort of get up and go. Yeah, the fizz, Jesus Christ, the lads will fizz like, like anything. And bronze, you can look at me like, I don't bronze. I go red and then go back to being Casper the Friendly Ghost. Tommy's. He's absolutely stackers for one. Like that bloke's got, his arms are as big as my legs. Tom was a really good lad. All of them, good set of lads. Did you get it?
sent to target only. Target! A little bit quicker, Matty. Ready. Target! Nice, that was good. Okay, unload your rifles. As well as weapons and operational drills, the unit's first aid skills are assessed by Navy medics on board. Approaching a casualty, checking for any dangers. There will, there will be no dangers for your assessment. Checking for any response. Quick nudge. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? In each ear. Why well, a lot of us enjoy this job, because that's sort of bond you have for everyone. You, you work together, you eat together, you play together. It's just, it's one of those, you just look after each other as well. So you've been called to deal with a casualty who has collapsed suddenly, and you have to deal with the situation as you would in the real bed. Hello, you okay? Can you hear me? Hello there. Let me check for 10 seconds. Liam, he's a good bloke. He is a very good bloke, even though he has a face like a slapped ass most of the time. His morale's always high. Just sometimes you need to check on him because he looks like he's threaded. <laughs> even when he's not. What are you doing? Um, wait for 10 seconds, see if he's breathing, look, listen, fill. So you can see that there is no rise or fall. Tommy, I'd say, is a pretty typical bootneck. He's a big lad. He's, he's very sort of driven when we're on the course together. You could tell we were both sort of competing to see who's, who's better at shooting. Yeah, I feel like we, we all have trust in Tommy. <laughs> You'll live another day, mate. <laughs> Yeah, Up in the far north of Norway, Sam and his troop are now in the final stages of survival training. But standing between them and success is one last infamous test of mental and physical strength. The high north, the Arctic, is covered in frozen lakes and they're useful for navigation and not only that, but speed of movement. So being able to cross these frozen lakes is key because they're key terrain tactically and strategically in this environment. But after heavy snowfall, many of these lakes can become completely invisible to the naked eye, making crossing them deadly for the unprepared. Since we've been in Norway, because of how key those frozen lakes are, we've been throwing people into the ice so they can understand the effects of that cold water and that shock. Should the worst happen, you need to know how to react. I'm excited. This is a big, big box here. When you start the course, you know that icebreakers is coming that week because as a bit of right passage when, when you go out to Norway. It is nerve-wracking. And you just don't want to be the one to struggle with it. Go up, dagger them in to the side, slide your hand down, okay, and secure yourself. The ice-breaking drill is tried to be made as realistic as possible. What that looks like is a man on skis or snowshoes, and he will have a Bergen on one shoulder, and his ski poles held together on another. And what he's going to do confidently, he's going to step out to the edge, look into the horizon, and land in the middle of the ice hole. And there you go. From there then, he needs to return back to safe ice. So he'll push off to one side and save his kit and equipment. He'll then make his way back to the safe ice and he'll look to secure himself using his ski poles and daggering himself onto that ice. To make sure that we know that they are composed, they ask for permission to leave the ice. Permission to leave the ice. You can dunk your head under for splashing me. And I'll always give a small pause so they don't rush out. It shows me that they are composed and they're not in a complete rush uh, to get out of their little bath. OK, permission granted. Come on, dagger, go, now, go. And it's also a, a little bit of fun as well. When you're waiting and you're watching others do it, the lad's like giving you little tips, like pick up snow and stuff it down in your neck, rub it around your face, just try and take the shock off of it. But you have to consciously take a pause and think about controlling your breathing. Especially important for myself, like, if I'm not composed in front of the lads, then it doesn't send the right message, really. It's Sam's turn. 
If he can successfully complete the drill and exit the ice to the standards set by Bonners, he'll be allowed to move on to the next stages of his training. Sam has done exceptionally well this first week. Uh, he's performed to the standard and he's made up for his shortcomings. God. Yeah. To be fair, it wasn't that bad when I was in there. Just as soon as one get out. Oh my God. The toes. The toes, yeah. You can't hide in Norway. You, like, you've got to be absolutely all over everything. And if someone's not, pick them up for it. Because it's very easy to curl up in a ball in your hick suit, but that's not the right, that's clearly not the right thing to do. Well, I hope you never have to do again. <laughs> <laughs> the, the lads I went with were incredible. Yeah, hopefully. Working as a company group, uh, getting to know uh, the lads at that level uh, and, and just working with, with such a big group was brilliant. And yeah, something that I'll always remember. On board HMS Montrose, intelligence has been received that a fishing vessel in the ship's vicinity may be transporting a large amount of illegal narcotics. Can everybody relax, please? Captain Mann, team, the command aim is to conduct maritime scrutiny operations in support of CCF 150. Captain Mann, at this range, it will take 35 minutes to close the bow on sided boost to a range of 1,000 yards. Um, weapons boat is rigged in the starboard boat. Uh, all ammunition and weapons are available. Romans boarding team. Ma'am, the uh, Romans boarding team have 30 minutes notice to move. No equipment defects to report. Royal Marines can support the boarding. Thank you very much. Uh, boarding is approved. Let's go to the boarding stations. And supporting stations, and supporting yes. stations. The port side will be the engaged side. This will be a flag verification boarding. You'll get a pipe, hand boarding stations. We'll get all of our kit on, weapons and ammunition, and we'll basically load, make ready. Load. Ready. But straight up there, straight into kit and good to go. Draw pistols. Load. Ready. There's always going to be unknowns going on to a vessel of interest. The people on board are generally quite scared, quite terrified. Especially if they have got drugs on them as well, because they know that we're about to come and ruin their day, basically. I think well suited for Tommy to get on first, <laughs> definitely. Because you're going into the unknown. There's no saying what could jump on and find. It might be it's just a load of nice fishermen, but it could be a device or someone with a weapon. I want to be the first man over the ladder myself, but that's not my job. Tommy's not just the first on the ladder. He essentially acts as my personal bodyguard on there. One downstairs, two coming out now. Forward! Jim, to the front! Jim, move to the front now! I was very happy when the boss gave me that job role being first over. It's a great responsibility to have. We're going to start with side, yeah? Get the ladder over. All right, lads up. First man over the ladder. You don't know how many crew there are or what their state is. You never know what to expect. If I get on, and someone pops a corner and then takes me on, I know for a fact that Liam's going to be right behind me. He's literally right at my ass, getting on top. When he's like, jumping over the ladder, I, I fear for anyone on the other side. Like, he's, like, he's, he's one of my war dogs. Closely followed by Liam, next up the ladder, my little manx scrapper. <laughs> as the second man on, I'm there as the security for Tommy. Quite a buzz, to be fair. I'm not doing that. <laughs> First few minutes on the Dow, it's the most dangerous part of it. They know the vessel, we don't. There's a lot of 
variables that could happen, but all the lads are attuned to what can happen and what the reaction is. I, I don't speak very good Baluchi. Um, I'm not very good at Baluchi. I've got a little trip card, and uh, and we sort of have a bit of a chat. You're not fishing. No, <laughs> not a chance. Yeah, where? All of it. How much? How much? And he was like, five. Like what? Five hundred kilos? Like, no, um, <laughs> five ton. <laughs> You're like, oh god. <laughs> and the lads are just like stepping over the stuff. They can barely move for it. It's at that point that you know this is a good day. This is a good day. In total, the team recover a massive six and a half tons of hashish, which could be worth over six million pounds. It's the heaviest bust in the region for a decade. Clear out, Sausby. Clear lower deck. Clear lower deck above all ranks and ranks. Buster on the flight deck for whole ship photo. Rig will be daily working rig with caps. Funny way of spelling our own. What does that say? <laughs> I was buzzing, finding the drugs and completely hitting the target. It was, yeah, it was mega satisfying. It was just like a complete shock of how much there actually was and it just makes all the time and effort that we put into boardings, being up so early, getting in the water all this time, just makes it worth it. I feel very lucky to be, to be part of this team. We've done all this training and to see the success of that shows that we are capable of doing that job and doing it well. I mean, you could do it, Brent, but it's cool you don't. It does feel good to be able to prove your worth and prove that you are part of the elite. We can't do our job without the Navy. Mum, can we get you in a, a fuck with the team? Particularly the captain, a fine officer. She understood my team and she understood that she needed to let us work and let us do our job. Wow. And so it's an achievement up and down the chain. Most of the Marines had never done a deployment before and they smashed it out of the park. One more, with, we'll just do the boarding team. They are, without a doubt, exceptional blokes. It's pride. I, I'm really proud of my team.